Mr. Arpey back with you again for chapter eight of our SEC 110 lecture series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about wireless network security. We're going to look at the different types of wireless network attacks, vulnerabilities in IEEE 80211, and explain solutions for securing those vulnerabilities when building a wireless network. So there are a large number of attacks that can be directed specifically against wireless data systems. Just a few examples would be things like Bluetooth, uh, near-field communication and radio frequency identification breaches, as well as specific wireless LAN attacks. To understand Bluetooth attacks, first we have to understand what Bluetooth is. It's a short-range radio frequency-based wireless technology uh, that runs from about 2.4 to 2.485 gigahertz. It provides rapid device pairing, so we can hook devices up quickly, be able to transition between devices. Uh, and then there are also multi-point connections that have been established and it generates what's called a personal area network, or PAN. PAN technology is sometimes also referred to as a PicoNet. Um, Pico, of course, being a prefix um, that we use for units, so same thing we get from uh, kilo, giga, mega, etc. Pico is on the opposite side. This is established when two Bluetooth devices come within range of each other, and you start creating a hierarchy. Uh, one device controls all wireless traffic, and that's your, your master interface. And then you have slave devices that connect to this as well. Now, active slaves send transmissions, and park slaves are connected but not actively participating. So um, these devices are continuously in a state of transitioning between dormancy and activity uh, and become either active or parked accordingly. Some of the attacks we might see would be things like blue jacking. Uh, there's blue jacking, blue snarfing. Um, blue jacking is just going to send unsolicited messages to a Bluetooth enabled device. It's much more annoying because no data is actually stolen. It's all uh, intrusion based, injection based. Text messages, images, sounds. Um, so think of an annoying pop up ad on your desktop. The more dangerous one is blue snarfing. And this is where an attack can access unauthorized information from your device through your Bluetooth connection. So if you leave your Bluetooth connected into discoverable mode and somebody else is able to take advantage of this, they can manipulate the profiles that are used to uh, be able to transfer data, connect to wireless devices such as printers, uh, or be able to transfer audio or uh, other types of data. This is often between a cell phone and a laptop because laptops tend to have much more information uh, accessible to them and then the transition is much more uh, profound whenever that data is breached. And of course, as we know from previous discussions of attacks on wireless networks, we can have uh, a pivoting attack that moves from the Bluetooth network into the primary wireless network of the uh, laptop that's compromised, or in some cases, a cell phone. Near field communication, NFC. It's a set of standards that we use to establish communication between two proximal devices, meaning that they are within proximity of one another, about four centimeters, uh, pretty, pretty narrow space. Devices can also be tapped together, again, within that proximal range. And when this is done, it's going to create a two-way communication handshake, uh, basically direct authentication by physical proximity. Devices can either be passive or active. Passive device is going to contain info that other devices can read, but does not read or receive information itself. Um, RFID tags, which we'll talk about in a second, are very similar to this uh, in that they have the ability to be uh, read, but not necessarily read or receive information themselves. Um, so things like a, a, a tracking tag or microchip for a pet. Active NFC devices are able to read and transmit data, um, so they can do both. And you can see here on the right, we have um, a tag and an interrogator. The interrogator, of course, is the active uh, reading or tracking mechanism. And then the tag is the passive device that contains the information to be read. Um, the antennas are basically just very, very thin coils of wire. Uh, often these tags are going to have, you know, the, the traces are really, really small. Um, and because there is only one device that needs to be powered, the tags themselves can be very tiny. And then the magnetic fields that are generated by these two antennas can then be uh, read and data inferred therein. NFC can be used for all kinds of authentication purposes uh, between users, devices, and their um, sometimes much larger devices. Um, I've seen NFC tags used in cars, um, used in entertainment centers for augmented reality games, geocaching. Uh, retail stores like um, Shopkick used an early form of NFC to be able to authenticate whether or not somebody was physically present in the store. Um, offices, you can use them for security purposes to enhance 
uh, proximity alerts to unlock a particular device. And then, of course, in transportation as well. NFC devices and contactless payment are very, very common. So if you use Android Pay, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, uh, Google Pay, any of those that require wireless contact between your phone and the payment terminal, that's going to be based on NFC. Again, you want it to be something that is so close, it would be very difficult uh, to spoof it because in terms of a physical contact, uh, you wouldn't want something that could be easily skimmed. Uh, RFID, on the other hand, as we talked about just a moment ago, is much more based on distance and can easily be spoofed um, with a, uh, a scanner that's sitting up in a particularly high traffic area, um, kind of analogous to a watering hole attack. If we look at the chart here on the right in the graphic, we can see a couple of different vulnerabilities that are possible using NFC. Unencrypted communication between device and terminal can be intercepted and viewed, um, but again, because it has to be extremely close, this is going to be unlikely unless, of course, you're using a device that has been compromised in and of itself. If you look up skimmers for uh, ATMs or for other payment receptacles, uh, gas station terminals, things like that, um, you'll see that they've gotten incredibly sophisticated, but there is still some obvious um, visible stuff that's there. Sometimes the, the ribbon will be hanging slightly, it'll be misaligned, uh, you know, it'll be attached with sticky tape or uh, other types of adhesives that are a little bit more visible. Data theft uh, can, of course, be done if we were to uh, bump a reader to a smartphone in order to try and force an NFC connection if it were in discoverable mode. But in general, um, NFC requires authentication. So if you use, uh, again, Apple Pay or Samsung Pay or Android Pay, you'll notice that it requires a, a thumbprint, a pattern, or facial recognition before engaging. Uh, man in the middle attacks, you can have an attacker that can intercept communications between devices and forge a fictitious response, again, kind of like a, um, a po an art poisoning attack. And then, of course, um, this is defended against by making sure that when the contact is initiated, uh, one is in receive mode and one is in send mode, so they're not both in promiscuous contact mode. And then device theft, of course, uh, is always a concern, so you want to make sure that your device is always protected. You know, make sure you have a PIN, passcode, uh, remote wiping capability, um, you know, GPS tracking, things like that would be very, very good ideas to have, especially if you have, um, you know, payment information easily accessible through your phone wallet. RFID, commonly used to transmit information based on inventory, labeling, identification badges. Um, these types of tags, unlike NFC, are able to cover a much larger radius. I know that uh, Walmart and some other stores actually use these on the um, the pallets or skids that they strap inventory to as they get shipped from place to place so they can identify where a particular object is in the warehouse very quickly. Most RFID tags, just like they are with NFC, are passive, uh, so they can be very small. They don't require power supplies. A lot of RFID tags are currently susceptible to different attacks, uh, even though Generation 2, which is the current standard, has made some modifications uh, to the G1 standard. So, you know, we could ensure that unauthorized tag access has to be corroborated with some other form of authentication. Multi-form authentication is always good. Um, then, of course, fake tags. This can be where tags are cloned. Um, just the other day, I was talking with a, a co-worker who said that they had found a deal on eBay trying to find a particular um, NFC-based Nintendo figurine. Um, they're called uh, Amiibos. And those devices uh, essentially allow you to have interactions with a game on your Nintendo Switch uh, using this little figurine because it has an NFC chip in the bottom. There is a device that spoofs up to 200 of them at the same time. You just have to, you know, flip these little dip switches in order to set your value. And I was like, holy cats. Um, so obviously, again, yeah, these are fairly easy to, to copy uh, and be able to reproduce. And then eavesdropping is another one that uh, we're concerned about unauthorized uh, listening in on the communication, if you will. Um, you know, you'd want to make sure that this stuff would not be leaked, kind of like when we talk about the concern over theft of uh, medical device information. Wireless LANs, uh, of course, you know, these are designed to supplement or replace a, a standard LAN. It's important to understand where the IEEE standards for wireless LANs came from, what kind of hardware we have to have present for the network to function and the different types of attacks that we may see in both enterprise or commercial and residential environments. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE, um, dates all the way back to 1884, um, you know, when electricity first started really kind of making the rounds. 
um, you know, Galvani's original experiments, and eventually it was a, kind of a party trick, especially if you talk about guys like uh, Ben Franklin. Um, but it really didn't start gaining major traction as far as network architecture standards until the 1980s, which was about um, 15 to 20 years after ARPANET had really picked up, um, you know, the original internet project. So in 1997, there was the release of the primary wireless standard we talk about, 802.11a. Um, this was the, the, the primary standard for wireless local area networks, but it didn't stay at the top for very long because there were new uh, improvements that were constantly being made. Of course, technology improved over time, and with use comes errors, and with errors come corrections. At least we hope so. So eventually they found ways to increase the speed, increase the range, things like that. So in 1999, only two years later, I believe it was only about 18 months, 802.11b was uh, proposed, ratified, standardized, and published. Um, 802.11a specifies a maximum speed of 54 megabits per second um, using the 5 gigahertz spectrum. 802.11b, I believe, operated on the 2.4 gig standard. Um, 802.11g and AC, I think we're all the way up to... Uh, say like AQ or something like that. Wi-Fi 6 is the common name for the standard that's currently uh, in use. So here we can see these different bands as they operate over time. You can see that the maximum data rate changes significantly over time, uh, the range indoors and out of doors, and the date of ratification. You can see fairly significant improvements um, in terms of things like the uh, uh, the, the rate of speed going from 2 megabits all the way back in the original standard uh, to 7.2 gigabits on AC, and that was only ratified seven years ago. Wireless LAN hardware is very much like wired hardware. It has to have an adapter, there has to be software that communicates from that adapter to the operating system and back, and there has to be some form of infrastructure to carry the signal. So we have to have, uh, at some point, even with the best wireless systems, we have to have some kind of access point to be able to receive and send signals. There's a, uh, an antenna in there, and that will pass it back to a wired infrastructure, which allows it to connect to the internet at large. <clears throat> the access point um, has a couple of major components that we need to be able to identify. The antenna and radio transmitter slash receiver, bridging software, and then of course the wired interface to pass it back to the standard wired network. Um, the access point's functions are as a base station for the network to send and receive signals, seems pretty straightforward, and then bridging uh, the wired and wireless networks. Because remember, this is important. We want all of these things to be interoperable. So wireless networks can't just communicate um, on their own local segment. They have to be able to pass information back to the internet at large. Wireless LAN with an AP is in what's called infrastructure mode. Without an AP, it's called ad hoc mode. Uh, ad hoc devices can only communicate locally, meaning that they cannot connect externally to another network because there is no device to pass things into a gateway. Um, ad hoc devices can't be set up uh, traditionally in bridge mode to be able to connect to another device that has um, a infrastructure connection. Now the Wi-Fi Alliance has created a similar specification to ad hoc mode called Wi-Fi Direct. If you use um, AirDrop or if you use uh, Android Beam or any of those, they will often use um, Wi-Fi Direct specifically for data transmission. NFC or RFID is often used for uh, authentication at first. Residential wireless LAN gateways. Uh, these, of course, are going to be used by small offices or home users to connect to the net. Uh, you may think of this as a SOHO router, something you may have heard of before. So you could include APs, firewalls, routers, DHCP servers, and other functions. In a network, we often think about boundaries, you know, physical boundaries, logical boundaries, etc. Where is the demarcation point between one network and the next? So, for instance, with a wired connection, it's very easy to find the hard edge of these networks because the boundary is very well defined. The physical space occupied by the cable, hosts, and infrastructure devices is, is not uh, nebulous in any way. But when we enterprise WLAN became a thing, when we started dealing with more wireless connectivity inside of a network, these edges began to blur very quickly. So if we look at the graphics for 8.6 and 8.7, you can see we go from a very boxy structure that looks like a conventional, uh, you know, stick figure style map of a building. We can see at the edge where we introduce these access points, all of a sudden we have this kind of radial bleed 
of where the network actually covers versus the physical boundaries. You could draw kind of a dotted line um, just beyond where the access point is and be able to see that there's a, a segment that goes beyond the physical space, you know, past the, the wall of the building or whatever else. If somebody were able to sit in a parking deck or, um, you know, be on the roof of the building or things like that, they could be able to wirelessly sniff information coming in, inject uh, potential infections, things like that, uh, and be able to take advantage of that wireless LAN um, all without being physically proximal to a server, router, or even a local host. So different types of wireless tax exist, as I'm sure you know. Rogue access points can uh, lead to trickery with traffic, interception of data, denial of service, evil twin attacks, and the uh, old wireless replay, which we use a lot with man in the middle attacks, as you'll see later on. A rogue access point is just an access point that's not being controlled by the um, internal infrastructure. It allows attackers to bypass network security configurations because then you're able to either uh, trick traffic into connecting to your access point or you can uh, be able to pass information directly to the primary infrastructure. Tri uh, traditionally, it's gonna be set up by an insider or employee, some kind of uh, local saboteur who may be behind a firewall, which then opens the network up to an attack because that AP being inside is now a direct backdoor uh, to move information into the network without passing the firewall first. Evil twin attacks, these are APs set up by an attacker which attempts to mimic an authorized AP, so rogue access point and evil twin are often um, talked about in the same breath, trying to either breach a network uh, or capture traffic. You can see down here in the graphic in 8-8 uh, um, how both of these kind of work together in terms of being able to, to break open a network security listings. You know, the rogue AP and the, and the bleed over of an evil twin, that's all over on the right side, whereas the, the firewall itself is on the left. So that's just kind of illustrating in a physical capacity um, how difficult it is to make sure that all the edges of your network are blocked in when you have something like a Wi-Fi network in place for a, uh, an enterprise LAN. Of course, because it's radio frequency, wireless signals can be easily connected to a, uh, a non-authorized user or just, you know, sniffed or otherwise intercepted. Um, if the AP has been misconfigured, open, uh, is left open, or has been breached in some capacity, you know, if it's a vulnerability due to initialization factors or things like that. Once we've got the WLAN cracked, we can yield all kinds of information about the internal wired enterprise network. Wireless replay is also called man in the middle or hijacking, is where captured data is recorded and then sent on without being detected. So the evil twin AP is often a good partner for this because you are able to essentially uh, trick people into recording information onto your hardware, which you have access to, then you pass it on as if it were completely normal and nobody's able to identify uh, that anything's wrong because the behavior seems in step with what they expect. Just like in customer service when you're working in retail or in food service, setting an expectation is everything. So if you're an attacker, you're setting the expectation that everything should work just as seamlessly as if uh, there was no interception at all. Wireless DOS. There's three primary tactics here. Uh, radio frequency jamming, essentially flooding uh, the inbound spectrum so that the AP can't communicate with legitimate users. Spoofing, so it can essentially impersonate uh, the trusted client, uh, where it would be um, something that the user would expect to be active in a particular capacity, and then manipulating the duration field values in order to block out legitimate users. Wireless home attacks are usually not as sophisticated, but of course it will still happen. Um, there is a lot more likelihood that somebody can carry out an attack in this way, especially if it's in an apartment complex or somewhere that there may be individuals who um, change out often. If you were a business person and you were staying in a, an efficiency or a hotel or something else, you wouldn't think anything of it if people were coming and going at all hours. So the likelihood is, you know, somebody could rent a room, try and snipe some uh, wireless data and then be on their way, especially if they use a stolen credit card to uh, impersonate. These attackers can steal data, inject malware, read transmissions and download harmful content. So very much the same stuff that we saw for the corporate side of the intrusions. So the original 802.11 committee recognized that wireless transmissions could be vulnerable. The radio frequency, how could they not be? So let's see what type of protections they came about. WEP. Now, WEP, when it first came out, wasn't that bad. The problem is it violated a cardinal rule of cryptography. 
It was designed to ensure that only authorized transmissions can view, uh, be viewed by authorized parties. So encrypted transmissions could only be seen by the people who were supposed to be seen uh, by creating a ciphering uh, between the original text and the transmitted text. That transmitted cipher text was done with a secret key that should only be shared between the wireless client device and the AP. Now, the problem here, as I said, was it violated a cardinal rule of cryptography, and that was to avoid a detectable pattern. Because it only used either a 64-bit or 128-bit number to encrypt, it was pretty easy to actually break the possibilities that were there. So the initialization vector, or IV, which allows you to um, set up the initial encryption of the key, is only 24 of the bits in question. So we're still talking a significant capacity here. You know, we're talking either um, a little bit less than uh, less than half, or around 20 to 30 percent. So that's still a pretty big chunk of that uh, of that encryption bit. So it's pretty easy to break a 24-bit encryption because we have a detectable pattern and we see IVs start to repeat themselves based on a cycle. We could then assume that we could start injecting IVs that meet that pattern and start spoofing the connection. WPS, or Wi-Fi Protected Setup, this is an optional means of configuring security on wireless LANs. I personally am not a huge fan of a WPS, though I do see in certain cases where it's useful, especially where you need to um, deploy a network quickly and make sure that nobody has uh, external access or compromises passwords. You want to make sure you have that physical confirmation, just like you would with a token or something similar. The PIN method which is the first of the two methods we'll talk about here, utilizes a um, personal identification number printed on a sticker on the router itself or displayed through some kind of software interface. Once the pin is entered, security configuration automatically occurs. The push button method is where there's a physical button on the device and security configuration takes place when the button is pushed and is correctly initiated in the software. Now, the problem is, there is no lockout limit for entering pins. So you can keep trying and trying and trying and trying until you get there. Most pins are only four to six characters and the last character is a check sum, meaning that it's gonna verify the other either three or five digits. And if we're talking about you know, combinatorics, if we have 36 characters, so we have you know A through Z, uh, this is only if we ignore case, uh, and then we have zero through nine, then we can multiply that out to 36 to the third or fifth power, which is actually computationally speaking, not that large of a number. The wireless router then reports the validity of each half of the pin separately. So that means if half of it is cracked, then we don't have to continue cycling through the rest. So we actually have uh, a pin instead of being three characters that we have to figure out, we can then figure out only two or possibly one. Uh, once we've got that half of the pin, then we can cut our operations in half again. <clears throat> MAC filtering. This is where we can limit uh, a device's access to an AP by saying we're only going to allow MAC addresses that we already know, uh, which is why a lot of wireless devices will actually have the MAC address in barcode form on the side of the box so that for a, a corporate uh, consumer, they can actually take a barcode scanner, click it, and be able to add it into their inventory quickly. Nearly all wireless AP vendors will implement some form of MAC filtering in order to block the physical address um, of, the, of the device at that at le level two, essentially, data link. <clears throat> the vulnerabilities of MAC address filtering is that the addresses are exchanged unencrypted, which means that the attacker can see the address of an approved device and then spoof it. And then if we have a large number of addresses, it can be challenging if we have a less uh, financially vigorous infrastructure. If we don't have money, it takes a lot more labor. If we have money, then we can do it with less labor. So as you can see on the right, the two graphics for 8, 9, and 8, 10, um, the first half of the uh, MAC address, which is their two 24-bit uh, sequences broken into hexadecimal, the first half is the OUI, tells you who made it, and the last half is the IAB, or the uh, interface ID, tells you which ID in the uh, OUI is being generated. So for every member of the OUI, they have 24 bits to represent, or two to, uh, to the 24th power um, representations for each one. And then in 810, you can see that the uh, MAC addresses can be added to the list using a simple uh, HTML interface like this. 
the SSID service set identifier. Uh, this is the user supplied network name of a network. So it's broadcast so that any device can see it, meaning that we can make it easy for people to connect. But if we don't want people to be able to connect to it, if we only want to have people connect who know the network name and know the password, it is a very weak form of security enhancement, but it does work. Um, it just slows things down. But the reason that this is not considered strong for most attackers is that it's not always possible to turn off the SSID beacon uh, meaning that it still says, hey, there's a network here, I'm just not going to tell you what my name is, which means that it can possibly be cracked. Um, there's also problems with if you have multiple APs that are configured to the same SSID and you want to be able to allow them to move from one point to another without having to re-authenticate. So if you have a you know, hospital or school or a library and you have multiple APs to cover a very large service area, you want to make sure that uh, that SSID is active so that it's able to smoothly transition from one to the next. Again, security and convenience not good bedfellows. We still, with these mitigations, have issues. So what do we do? Well, we start involving uh, a couple of other consensus-based organizations to try and improve matters. So IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance started working together to develop some security solutions. And the standards that result are still in use today. 802.11i, which even though it's a little bit old, is still implemented. And then WPA and WPA2. Now, Wi-Fi Protected Access, or WPA, is a subset of 802.11i, which was introduced in 2003. WPA introduces uh, some replacements for previous standards that were considered weak in terms of both encryption and authentication. The two modes that we see in WPA are personal and enterprise. Um, basically, the, the enterprise is going to have a much more extensive means of encryption, and it's also going to require the passphrase be slightly more complex. In WPA, we have a protocol called TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity. It has a 128-bit key length, and for each new packet, there's going to be a dynamically generated key, which I think it'll last for only, I think, 10,000 cycles, uh, which does not take a lot of time. It might, it might actually be 1,000. I may have an order of magnitude off there. I'd have to double check. It also includes a message integrity check or mic check, one, two, one, two, which is designed to present man in the middle attacks with a significant challenge. Um, prevention here is gonna say, we're gonna have an additional piece of information that's generated through a secondary algorithm that would then have to be spoofed as well. So again, just creating deterrence. We're creating more things that they would have to verify uh, in order to uh, break our, our encryption. WPA personal authenticates by using what's called a PSK, or pre-shared key. Um, you know, what's your Wi-Fi password? It's a PSK. After we set up the AP, client devices all have to have the same key value entered to be on the same wireless network. The key has to be shared prior to communication taking place, so you'll want to make sure that that's only given to individuals uh, who are considered to be authorized. It uses a passphrase to generate the encryption key, which must be entered on each AP and wireless device in advance. If a device has the secret key, they are then automatically authenticated. We got some problems though. PSKs aren't perfect. Key management is done manually without security protection. The key has to be changed regularly, and if you want to allow a guest user, you have to tell them what the key is. If you have a passphrase that's less than 20 characters long, very much like we talked about just a minute ago with the, the three to five character pin and the checksum, um, fewer than 20 characters would mean that it's subject to cracking. So, uh, you know, if you're going to use a passphrase, you would usually want to look at um, the minimum and maximum lengths for whatever it uses. Uh, for more conventional users, I'll say half. You know, if it's zero to 64 characters, I can't imagine why it would ever be zero. Um, but, it, you know, if, if the maximum is 64 characters, gun for 32. You know, if you go through um, modern stuff for Samsung and Apple, I know, as well as uh, companies like LastPass, will automatically dynamically generate passwords for you of a predefined length. I think the Apple ones are like 20 characters and change. And then, of course, um, with LastPass, you can have stuff that's, you know, over 100 characters long. Pretty significant stuff. Wi-Fi Protected Access 2, which was an update to WPA introduced in 2004, also includes personal and enterprise models and addresses two major security areas of WLANs, which are, of course, encryption and authentication. How do we make sure everybody is who they say they are and make sure that information is staying private until it is correctly decrypted by those authorized individuals? That's when we bring in AES and CCMP. 
We'll get into that alphabet soup for our encryption. AES stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. It's a block cipher, so it takes blocks of information, specifically 128 bits of plain text, and performs three encryption steps. We go ahead and do one step of encryption. In the second step, then we have multiple iterations that get performed there. And then bytes get substituted and rearranged. Then we have a, uh, a third step that is performed as well. CCMP, which is counter mode with cipher block chaining message authentication code. Uh, so the C in CCMP, second C, stands for CBC. And the M stands for MAC. So it should actually be CMCBCMACP. But somebody thought that was ridiculous. The encryption protocol specifies the use of uh, CCM with AES. So counter mode. Um, uh, basically means that it's going to constantly generate challenge tokens. Cypher blockchain message authentication code is a component that provides integrity and authentication. Um, both TKIP and CCMP use 128-bit keys and 64-bit mic values for encryption. Um, I do think CCMP is slightly harder to crack based on its method of generation. But again, um, as long as you're using WPA or WPA2, for the most part, you're pretty solid. WPA3 is currently, um, I believe, in uh, in final standardization, but it hasn't become industry standard the way WPA2 has. 802.1x, originally developed for wired networks, provides a greater degree of security by focusing on port-based authentication. So if you work with uh, VLANs and being able to set up port security through those, especially Cisco stuff, you're going to see 802.1x and uh, 802.1q, I believe. Now, until a client is authenticated, all traffic on a port-by-port -port basis will be blocked. Um, so that means that you're going to essentially drive up to the gate, have to be authenticated, then you get let in. Uh, so here we can see the steps. Um, supplicant asks to join the network, so that's the initial request. Authenticator asks for identity verification. Identity gets submitted. Then the information gets passed into the authentication server, gets checked through, and then the authentication server verifies or rejects and the supplicant is then either approved or denied. Part of this is what's called EAP, EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol. This is a framework for transporting authentication protocols to make sure that we are not transmitting in plane, things like that. We're going to use four different types of packets to run in EAP, Request, Response, Success, and Failure. These uh, packets can all be encrypted directly so that that way they can only be decrypted between the authentication server um, and the verification server. There are three different types of EAP we talk about um, beyond what's called PEEP, which is the, the common one. Uh, EAP TLS uses digital certificates. DAP TTLS um, uses transport layer security records. EAP FAST will tunnel things using TLS. Uh, and then protected EAP or PEEP to simplifies the deployment of 802.1x by using Windows criteria, login and passwords. Um, this is going to create an encrypted channel again between the client and the authentication server uh, using the authenticator as the bridge between. Other steps that can be taken, rogue AP system detection, again, when we have uh, challenge tokens or challenge methodology employed using the correct type of AP. Of course, making sure you're configured correctly and then wireless peripheral protection. So when we talk about rogue AP discovery tools, there are four different types of probes we can use to monitor the airwaves for traffic. Wireless device probe, AP probe, desktop probe, and dedicated probes. Uh, any of these can pick up different types of rogue APs by essentially comparing what's considered to be safe within the given range uh, and what's normative based on a baseline. Once a suspicious signal is detected, information can be sent to a centralized database where the WLAN's management software will compare it to an approved list. Any device not on this list is considered rogue and will be flagged for any traffic that is inbound. AP types can, divided, can be divided into three primary categories, FAT versus thin, controller versus standalone, and captive portals. FAT versus thin APs uh, are where we have autonomous APs versus lightweights. Autonomous APs have the ability to manage wireless authentication, encryption, and other functions, meaning that they are able to stand on their own weight. They contain 
uh, enough computing power to be able to handle several different functions that an AP would be expected to be do. Uh, a lightweight AP is traditionally going to be kind of like a thin client like we would expect in virtualization. It's got just enough power to be able to take in information and pass it on to a wireless LAN controller, which can then do all of the thinking for it. Standalone APs uh, versus controller APs, which is a similar argument, slightly different. Controller APs can be managed through the WLC. The WLC is the only configurable device, and then the automatic settings are passed on to controller APs. This is why thins are so handy uh, for this kind of structure, because the AP itself is not what you would want to breach. You would want to get into the WLC, and you would have to breach the AP, be able to successfully pivot into the WLC, and then be able to move from there. Other advantages with controllers, the handoff procedure is eliminated because there's no authentications being handled by the AP itself. There are also tools that can be involved with the WLC that provide for monitoring the environment, providing information regarding the best locations uh, so we can get the best coverage, configuration settings, and power settings so it can read interference, it can make sure that there's not obstruction. Captive portal APs use a standard web browser to provide information, also making sure that people can present login credentials or agree to a policy um, and be, you know, essentially legally culpable uh, if there is a problem with their um, violation of the AUP. Some AP settings are designed to limit the physical area that the uh, wireless RF would cover so that a minimum amount of signal goes beyond the walls of the enterprise to be accessible to outsiders. A big part of this is doing what's called a site survey. This involves something called a heat map, which is where we can actually identify the uh, EM radiation that can be covered by a given AP, other obstructions or sources of EM, and other types of in-depth examination and analysis of a proposed WLAN site. Signal strength settings, of course, can be adjusted. It's just uh, reducing or increasing the amount of wattage. In most cases, it's gonna be milliwatts um, that are passed into the antennas of the, the LAN transmission bits. Reducing the power means that we cut the signal, increasing it means that it can reach a little bit further. We have to be careful though, because just like overclocking uh, on a processor, you can cause damage by incorrectly configuring your antennas. Spectrum selection, this means that we can adjust the frequency band, channel, uh, as well as the t not only the type of channel, but the width in which it operates. So if you see like uh, 20 slash 40 mode, it means that channels are either 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz wide. And then of course we are talking about what division of the, um, the EM spectrum is being divided up. Are we working in the 2.4 gigahertz range or we're working in the five gigahertz range, uh, so on and so on forth. Antennas of course should be near the center of proposed coverage high to reduce obstruction and deter theft, so we want them out of the way. Uh, it also depends on what type of antenna you have. Do you have an omnidirectional? Do you have a, a conical antenna that's focused? Um, you know, things like that. Wireless peripheral protection. Uh, this is wireless in terms of uh, usually Bluetooth. This is where vulnerable vulnerabilities can be common for uh, wireless mice and keyboards. So if you have uh, a Logitech system where you're dealing with uh, a lot of traffic going through one of those little uh, Logitech hub or unified controllers, that can be problematic because threat actors could inject either mouse movements or keystrokes from up to 100 yards away. So how do we deal with this? Well, we update our mice, uh, you know, get the drivers good and going, uh, especially because generic drivers do not have device signatures, which means they're easier to manipulate. Um, make sure that you're buying things from reputable sources. Make sure that you're, uh, again, not taking modifications or custom firmware. And if you're really concerned about it, of course, you can substitute with a wired mouse or keyboard. Now, I will say as time goes on, there's probably going to be significant improvements in the security available for this type of wireless technology. Um, but at present, treat it like you would anything else. Make sure that you're um, testing for vulnerabilities, looking for potential problematic situ situations. Uh, you know, on occasion, you know, if you're a security technician, run an audit for any USB devices that look weird. It could be a key logger. It could be um, a micro SD interface. That is chapter eight. If you guys have any questions or concerns, of course, you can always contact me here on the YouTube page. You can contact me through my uh, Google voice number. You can contact me through my Cape Fear email. You can contact me through Blackboard. Um, you know, comments and emails are how I do better with this. So if there's something that you feel that needs improvement, I am always available uh, to try and discuss that because in the end, that's what it's for. It's for improving you guys' understanding of this content. All right, 
Well, I thank you as always for your time and attention, and I will see you all next class.